Let's talk about spectra. When we shine light through a diffraction grating or prism, it disperses into the traditional seven colors of the rainbow that we call the spectrum of white light, which are not in fact seven colors, as I'm sure you know by now. This is an example of a continuous spectrum. So it has a range of values all the way from one upper value to one lower value. Note that there are no discrete lines in this spectrum. One color merges into the next. The second kind of spectrum that we need to know about are line spectrum. So these are the particular wavelengths or frequencies of light given out by elements when you transfer energy to their atoms. So we can see here we've got neon, mercury, and sodium. And if you heat these elements, or indeed put them in a tube and put a high voltage across them, that transfers energy to the atoms of the element, and we see these particular very discrete frequencies being given out. And each element produces a specific set of lines, its own line spectrum. These line spectra are very useful in studying the universe, and I'll put a link to my Doppler effect video so that you can look at how astronomers use these line spectra to figure out the distances to galaxies. Now, light is given out by an element like this because its atoms have become excited. The frequencies that are given out are dependent on the photon energies that are given out, and that is determined by what the electrons in these atoms do. So we're going to investigate this using the simplest possible element, hydrogen, because it has only one electron. So it becomes very easy to track what is happening to that electron as you give it energy. When a large voltage is applied across a sample of hydrogen gas, that's going to transfer energy to that gas, and that energy is absorbed by its only electron. And this is the spectrum that's produced. There are three sections to it. The Lyman series, obviously we can't see because it's in the ultraviolet. We know ultraviolet are high frequency, so this is going to be the highest photon energies. We have the Passion series down here, which are in the infrared, so these are the low frequency, low energy photons. And then what we actually see, and you can see the three colors that are produced in the hydrogen spectrum, if you're just looking at it, is the Balmer series, many of which is visible to the naked eye. The big question here is, what do the electrons do to cause these frequencies to be emitted from the atoms? We're going to take a very simple model of the atom to illustrate this. Let's suppose that's the nucleus in the center, and you have your electrons in orbits around the atom. When you excite an electron by transferring energy to it, it jumps from what's called its ground state to a more excited state. Stays in that more excited state for an indeterminate period of time, and then will jump back to the ground state, giving you back that energy as a photon of light. The frequency of that light energy that you get back depends upon the energy, and it depends upon which excited state the electron jumps to in the first place. So what are these states? Let's have a look at this simplified idea of the atom. Our electrons are around the atom in their orbits. We know that the electrons are attracted to the nucleus because of their opposite charge, so the electron on the innermost level in here will have the highest value of potential energy. And of course, the one on the outermost level will have the least value of potential energy. And I'm using the word value here because it's the magnitude of the potential energy that we're talking about. And that will become clear when we look at the potential well. Suppose you're walking down the street and then you fell into a very large hole in the ground. If your gravitational potential energy on the ground is zero, then when you fall into the hole, you've got less than zero gravitational potential energy because you're going to have to expend some energy getting out of the hole and back up to your previous state of zero. So we say you have a negative amount of gravitational potential energy at the bottom of the hole. And unless you can get some kinetic energy going to balance the potential energy that you lost in falling into the hole, you're going to be stuck there. This is what a potential well is. It's like a hole in the ground. And this is the situation that electrons are in. The ground state down here is you at the bottom of the hole. And this is the street level up at the top. The electrons are stuck in that ground state unless they can get enough energy to get into one of the other states. So for example, if you give it 10.21 electron volts of energy, 
then it could jump and get up to here. Now, note, 10.20 electron volts of energy is not going to be enough. These are discrete energy levels. If it absorbs 10.20 electron volts of energy, it doesn't get to go anywhere. It just is able to vibrate a bit more in the level that it's in. As soon as you give it 10.21, then it's going to go from the ground state up to the first excited state. Now, it can get that energy from anywhere. You could heat it and give it that energy. You can put a voltage across it and give it that energy. Or a photon could come in, collide with it, and transfer its energy and allow it to jump up. It stays up there, and then it will jump back down, giving you back 10.21 electron volts in the form of a photon. Let's figure out what wavelength of light that 10.21 electron volts is. If we want to convert that into a wavelength or a frequency, the first thing we need to do is to turn it into joules. That gives us 1.6336 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Now that's going to be equal to HF, which is our Planck constant equation. If you haven't yet watched my video on the photoelectric effect, I'll put a link to it here. Please do watch it so you understand where that equation comes from. We also know that F is equal to C over lambda. So we can substitute that into our Planck constant equation to get hc over lambda if the wavelength is what we need. So now we have our amount of energy is equal to hc over lambda. So our lambda is going to be equal to hc over our energy. h is the Planck constant given in the data book. c is the speed of light also given in the data book. And we have our value for energy so we can go ahead and calculate it. 1.22 times 10 to the minus 7 meters or 122 nanometers. If you know your electromagnetic spectrum, you know that 122 nanometers is not visible light. It's too short. So we know that this is going to be one of our UV photons. What about the other lines? Well, depending on the amount of energy that you put into the electron, an electron sitting in the ground state has a few options. If you give it 10.21 electron volts, it's only going to get up to the first excited state. And remember, it's that amount and that amount only. If you give it 12.1 electron volts, though, it can get up to the next one, because we can see 13.61 minus 1.51 is 12.1. It can get to the second excited state. If you give it the whole lot, the 13.61 electron volts, then it's going to get all the way out here. And so that corresponds to the work function or the ionization energy for hydrogen. If you made a photoelectric effect equation cathode out of hydrogen, which wouldn't be possible, but bear with me, then the work function that you would get is 13.61 electron volts. Once they get to the first, second, third, fourth excited states, then they start to jump back down. Jumps from the first excited state are fairly straightforward. They've only got one possible jump they can make, and we've already figured out that that is 122 nanometers, the wavelength of the light emitted. But what about the others? Jumpers from the second excited state have got two options. They can do it all in one go, at which point they give out 12.1 electron volts, or they can do it in two steps. First giving out 1.89 electron volt photon, and then giving out the 10.21. Once you get to the third excited state and the fourth excited states, the options become even greater. And from our top state here, there's a lot of choice. But remember, each jump that it makes corresponds to a change in energy, and that corresponds to a possible photon being emitted. So you can see, if an electron is in the second excited state, you're going to get three different photons emitted. One representing the jump all the way down, and that's going to be the highest energy and therefore the highest frequency, and the other two representing the halfway jumps down to the ground state. One thing to note, of course, just like absorbing, the electron has to make the whole jump down. There are no half measures. And this is why they call these energy levels discrete. They have particular values, meaning you have to have a particular amount of energy to get up to the next energy level, and you give that specific amount of energy back when you jump back down. 
So this is the whole picture of jumps, and it corresponds to the original bunches of lines that we saw. All jumps down to the ground state. Those are always going to be the biggest energy jumps. And that means they're going to have the highest frequency or shortest wavelengths of light. And so these are the UV photons that are given out here. That we saw were called the Lyman series. To the second excited state, from states above that, those are all very small energy jumps corresponding to low energy photons, low frequency photons, so longer wavelength. That's our passion series. And then in the middle, jumps to the first excited state are the actual visible ones that we see, and that's our bomber series. This is how emission spectra are formed. You need to be able to calculate what the energy changes would be between these jumps and convert that into either frequency or wavelength of the photon emitted.